Welcome to the last of our series of devotions for Easter week. And today we're going to consider the person who, with the obvious exception of Jesus, is perhaps most associated with Jesus' resurrection, and that's Thomas, forever known by the epithet Doubting Thomas. And you can find the account in John chapter 20. I have to admit to always feeling a bit sorry for Thomas, always remembered for his doubts, but I think he was only behaving as most of us, if we were honest, would do in the same situation. Now we don't know why Thomas wasn't with the other disciples when Jesus appeared to them on the evening of Easter Day. He certainly wasn't alone, as we saw on Wednesday, as we considered Cleopas and his travelling companion, who had headed away from Jerusalem at the first opportunity afforded by the end of the Sabbath, despite the breaking news that the tomb was empty. Perhaps the events of the preceding days had just been too much for Thomas and he perhaps needed space to try and make sense of things. But once again, in turning away from the fellowship of the disciples, of course he was one of them, Thomas misses out on the joy of meeting with the risen Lord Jesus, reminding us once again of the importance of keeping on meeting together to support and encourage one another. Now, I don't know how you respond if you've ever had the experience of turning up just after the event to meet a very excited group of people who are only too keen to tell you what you've just missed whether it was a particularly interesting train going through. Yes, there are such things as interesting trains, but that's a different talk entirely. Or as here, and far more significantly, the disciples having met with the risen Lord Jesus. As the other disciples excitedly tell Thomas that they've seen the Lord, Thomas perhaps somewhat grumpily replies that unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in his side, I will not believe. In reality, and that's why I've got a considerable degree of sympathy for Thomas, He's only doing what I know I'd do if I found myself in the same situation, and that's to seek evidence, seek proof of what I was being told, or perhaps that's just my scientific and engineering training kicking in. After all, the other disciples had just told him something that was so beyond the bounds of any human understanding or comprehension that Thomas not unreasonably wants proof, proof which, after all, the other disciples had received as they'd met with the risen Lord Jesus. Now jump forward a week and Thomas gets the proof he seeks, as the disciples meet together again, but this time Thomas is with them. John tells us that although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and once again greets them with that single word, Shalom, before he invites Thomas to reach out and touch his hands and to place his hand in the wound in his side, to know the physical reality of the risen Lord Jesus. Thomas doesn't need to touch the wound marks, for the sight alone is enough, and Thomas makes that deep and profound confession my Lord and my God. It's easy to gloss over these words, but they're deeply significant, for they bring John's Gospel full circle. We go back to the very beginning of John's Gospel, words that are so closely associated with Christmas. There we read that, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. These words introduce us to Jesus, the Word who was and is God, and by whom all things were made. And as we read on in chapter 1, we discover that the word is the very light and life of man. Much earlier in his ministry, Jesus had asked Peter who he thought that he was, to which Peter replied that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, but very quickly goes on to demonstrate that he singularly failed to grasp what that means. It's only now, on encountering the risen Lord Jesus, that Thomas, doubting Thomas, makes his utterly profound confession, my Lord and my God. It's Thomas who closes the loop and by confessing Jesus as my Lord and my God formally acknowledges Jesus as the word who was and is God not just in heaven but in his life as well. The word who was with God, who was God, who is God is now confessed as God by Thomas. Thomas, as Jesus was quick to point out, believed because he was able to see the risen Lord Jesus standing before him, to see the marks of the nails and the gash of the spear in his side. We are denied by time and space the privilege of seeing the risen Lord Jesus face to face, but we can still know the reality of the risen Lord Jesus and his power in our lives. Are you able to join with Thomas in confessing Jesus as both Lord and God, and to know the power of the risen Lord Jesus in your life? If you're not sure, can I encourage you to read one of the Gospels? Start perhaps with Mark, it's the shortest of the Gospels. Even if you don't have a Bible available in printed form, you can find 
copies of the Gospels in myriads of translations, free online to read. Alternatively, you can contact the church office and someone will be in touch with you. Or you can join one of our upcoming courses for an opportunity to explore the Christian faith in more detail. Again, the office will have all the details. But we'd love to have the opportunity to explore the Christian faith with you and to help to introduce you to the risen Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you raised your son, Jesus Christ, from the grave. Thank you for his victory over death. And Father, we pray that we would all know the power of the risen Lord Jesus, alive and at work in each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray.